This man created the Ethernet. That cable you plug into your Wi-Fi boxes to gain access to the internet so you can watch this video. And he did it while working a nine to five. Today, we sit down with Bob Metcalf, a pioneer who transformed how we communicate. We learn what it takes to invent a life-changing product. We had to kill two monopolies. We had to kill AT&T and we had to kill IBM in order to build the internet. The advice that Steve Jobs gave him. What kind of advice did he give that anything surprising about what he would advise you on? Most people think that Steve Jobs is the best CEO in the history of the world. But an interesting fact about that is that he f and whether the hard work and sacrifice was all worth it. In your career, do you have any regrets? Would you change anything? Was it worth it? Uh, Let's hear the story of the man who revolutionized the internet. So jumping right into the questions, um, how did you make your money? How would you answer that? Uh, or how did I make my money? I invented something. Then I started a company to commercialize it and succeeded and went public and sold some stock. Now I have more money than I can ever spend. The thing I invented, it's called Ethernet. I invented it at Xerox Research in Palo Alto, California on May 22nd, 1973. I guess what I'm curious, so you made your money inventing something, but you invented it as an employee? Or were you inventing it? Yes, I did. I invented it as an employee of Xerox Corporation. I'd like to correct what I said, by the way. I've, uh, I didn't make much money by inventing Ethernet. I made most of it by selling Ethernet, which is different. And uh, now they're, they're one fed into the uh, led into the other, but it was the selling process which took the time and the effort. So I've been to every Ramada Inn in, in the world. <laughs> Selling Ethernet. As an employee, do you think oh, I'm going to get rich off this? Or as you were creating it, like, hey, this is just part of my job? No, I, um, I was employed by Xerox. They paid me well. I had a lot of fun there and invented this thing and then left Xerox and returned to ask to propose that they license me the patents. And uh, in fact, license everyone the patents in order to make Ethernet into an industry standard. We figured we'd have to make it a, not a proprietary product of the Xerox Corporation. And they agreed. So uh, my company became one of hundreds to license Ethernet from Xerox. Why'd you leave? I left Xerox twice. And uh, it had to do with career considerations. I was, I had, I was there tw two segments of four years, in research for four years and development for four years. And uh, I just got done with just got done with what I was doing and it was time to move on. And then when you're in Silicon Valley, the, you start companies. And when you're in Silicon Valley, you're supposed to start companies. So in 1979, I left Xerox with the intention of pursuing entrepreneurial interests. And I had no clue what it would be, but a few months later, I started 3Com. How did you even figure out how to start it? I was in Silicon Valley, surrounded by people who knew how to start companies. So uh, I got a lot of advice from VCs and and Steve Jobs. He called me in. in uh, I mentioned him because he was one of my mentors. An odd mentor situation since I'm ten years older than he was. Uh, he called me in four, five days after I founded 3Com and invited me to join Apple, and I turned him down. And then he did a very interesting thing. He helped me for the next ten years. Uh, all through the 80s to build my company. He, in other words, he didn't get all, all huffy and yeah. storm off. He was great. Why do you think he helped you? I don't know. I think he something about entrepreneurship. He liked that. And uh, he could see that I, I had just founded the company a few days before, so I guess he was, you know, interested in that and what, what would come of it. <laughs> Plus, I pitched him. I wanted to sell him a product. So I came to, we had lunch on Stevens Creek Boulevard in Cupertino, California at a, a hippie restaurant where everything was vegan. And uh, I proposed that I would sell him a network to this company he had called Apple. And they had these Apple IIs. So I said, you need a network. And I, here's the, I happen to have a design for a network for you. And I call it Orchard. You see the little marketing flair there? He listened to that proposition for about four nanoseconds before returning to the discussion of my becoming a networking guy at Apple. 
he had no interest whatsoever in buying Orchard. I think maybe the the fact that I tried to be a marketing person and call it Orchard may have offended him. Yeah. What kind of advice did he give that anything surprising about what he would advise you on versus what you were doing? I've come to realize this uh, retrospectively, uh, the key thing he taught. Uh, most people think that Steve Jobs is the best CEO in the history of the world. But an interesting fact about that is that he founded Apple in 1976 and he became CEO in 1996. And so what he did in Silicon Valley is uh, he appreciated adult supervision. That's the term, adult supervision. So from the very beginning, he had people involved in his company who were at it with him, for him. And so I did that. So I, as soon as I raised some venture capital, went out and recruited Bill Krauss to come and be our CEO. I didn't know how to run a company, let alone start a company. Yeah, I, I think the two things you said that are really, really resonate with was one is selling, not inventing. Like anyone can invent, but to actually get people to buy and make it a business takes selling. Yeah. And I just had this realization over and over is that it's, it's very hard to be successful alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, like you did have to, Steve found people to support him in different areas. You found, sounds like this Bob Krauss guy. When you... What made you think to start this business over other things? And like, did you expect it to be as big as it got? Or what was the expectation for you? Well, as a grad student, so I graduated from MIT in electrical engineering and management in 1969. I went to Harvard, immediately hated Harvard. But the project that was funded at, Ar at both Harvard and MIT was a thing called the ARPA Computer Network, named after the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Department of Defense, ARPA. And a, a, a wise graduate student will choose a field where there's money because that will fund the PhD research that you do. And so that, I got into networking right then. And so then I was in networking for four years with, MIT. I worked at MIT but got my degrees from Harvard. And then I spent eight years at Xerox building an internet inside of Xerox. So then when I left Xerox in 79 to start my own company, what, what company was I going to start? I had to have something to do with all that, and it did. So the company was called 3Com, Computer Communication Compatibility. And our goal was to network um, diverse computers together. And most people forget this, but prior to the internet, every computer manufacturer made their own networking. If they made any networking at all, they were all incompatible. So the 3Com was founded to solve that problem, and uh, we were the first company to ship TCP IP, which is the uh, core uh, protocol of the internet. And we were the first ones to ship a commercial version of that, and then we did Ethernet, and we adopted Unix and MS-DOS, and off we went. What, what did you expect 3Com to become? 3Com? Yeah. It started life as a uh, consulting company immediately profitable. I hired, a, recruited a dozen people and we did consulting on networking and we were uh, profitable and we all had company cars. I had a Mercedes. And, but then we noticed that um, other people were starting Silicon, classic Silicon Valley startups with venture capital. And one of them was Ungerman Bass, which you've never heard of, but Ralph Ungerman and Charlie Bass and I discussed starting a company together, but our egos were too big, so we started two separate companies. And then he raised venture capital. And then he started bragging about having invented all the stuff that I invented. So it annoyed me. So then I put together a business plan in, in uh, September of 1980 and began uh, raising money. And in, in February of the next year, I raised $1.1 million for a third of the company, which are, these are laughable numbers. To yeah. Me. How much did that third go on to be at its peak, you think? Say again? How, how much did that third go on to be at its peak? It's kind of funny. Remember, you don't remember the internet bubble. You probably weren't born yet. Right at the, I was in high school. But there were a lot of super valuable companies and mine was among them. And for a few nanoseconds in 1999, with 5.7 billion in revenue, uh, and I had left the company. I wasn't there. It was worth $52 billion, inflation adjusted. But only for a few nanoseconds. It, you, you, if you look at the graph, it goes like this. Uh, and I didn't even get half of that $52 billion. That was wild. That was much later. I left three years later than I should have. I left after 13 years. 
And I realized the last three of those years I was hurting the company rather than helping it. I was, in the end, I was VP of corporate marketing. And my principal activity was arguing with our regional managers over advertising. They all wanted to have their own ads, write their own copy, choose their own logos, their own colors, everything. And I was the corporate um, brand Nazi. And I had traveled around the world convincing French people that they should use our brand, you know, our logo. Here's the, here's the artwork for our logo. You should use this. And uh, that was uh, not work that I was uniquely qualified to do. But I did know the difference between sales and marketing, and that's, that's one thing you need to learn early. What's that? Well, there are, many, there are many, many differences. There's not the same thing. Most people think sales and marketing are the same thing. But marketing has most, is mostly uh, incoming, and sales is mostly outgoing. Two things I'm curious for there is, like, how did you figure out it was time to go? I think for a lot of people, especially if you're starting a company, you're like, am I quitting too soon in it? Am I staying too long in it? I guess, how did you know that? All right, so in uh, 1980. Uh, two, I convened a meeting of the board of directors, of which I was the chairman and a large shareholder, to decide who was going to be the CEO. And we decided Bill Krauss was going to be the CEO, and I was not going to be. So that was the first time my board rejected me. And then 10 years later, I came back a similar. This is how I left. Uh, three of us were designated as su uh, succession candidates. And... Uh, and I was, surprisingly, I was one of the three. I was running the biggest revenue generator of the company, the hardware division. Uh, the, all those other guys like software. And, but I generated all the profits. But I didn't win. Eric won. So twice, my board of directors chose somebody else uh, to, run the, to be CEO of the company. And both times, they were right. In, in uh, the way it played out, there were two very good choices were made. And I'm not surprised because I built that board. I recruited those board members one by one. Uh, so I guess I was proud of the board. And it, uh, one of the important functions of a board is to um, uh, tell you the truth. Uh, Self-awareness is so hard. Very rarely does someone say, you know, I really can't do this job anymore. I don't have the skills and um, plus I'm getting tired. No one never does that. You have to fire their asses. And uh, that's the purpose of the board, is to fire your ass when, uh, when you're uh, no longer good. For, you need to be firing on all cylinders. It's the job of the board to be sure the big cylinder is firing correctly. So twice, a board that I recruited chose somebody else to be the CEO, and it worked. And both times, I, I can attest, they were right. Uh, Bill Krauss the first time, and Eric Benamou the second time, and the company went like a rocket ship after each of them took over, so it was great. Did people treat you differently before and after 3Con? Before and after you made you earn money? Yeah. Yeah, I became famous. And I, I had to develop tests for, you know, that goes to your head. I watched, I watched as little as $100,000 going to one of our engineers. I watched it ruin his life. Just 100,000, so not, not millions, just 100,000. So I began, uh, as uh, I got richer over time, trying to figure out how not to get uh, corrupted by it. And here's a, here's a simple example, a simple rule. If there's a bunch of you standing around and everyone's introducing, hi like Tom, hi like Noah, I could see Noah, and that all finishes, if you haven't said your name during that introduction period, you need an ego fix right there because you assume that everyone knows who you are. So that's a little test I perform. I watch. Did you say your name or do you assume that people uh, know who you are because you're so important? Yeah, yeah it's very easy uh, to be corrupted by money. As, and as I said, I remember this kid, Sonny, engineer, 100 grand, Drugs disappeared, and it was just 100K that got him. A sad story. So, uh, yeah, you have to guard. Uh, I think you have to, uh, if, if you're going to be successful and you start succeeding, then you have to start paying attention to succeeding well. Mm. Yeah, Bill Gates, actually, uh, Bill Gates, who I admire greatly, 
even though I frequently criticize him, uh, he once said a wise thing was, it would be harder for him to give away his money well than it was to make it. He's doing a damn good job of giving it away right now, I think. By the way, he and I are not close. I, when I was a columnist, uh, I attacked Microsoft for um, antitrust behavior, anti-competitive behavior, and Bill and I had a falling out at that time. <laughs> In your career, do you have any regrets? Would you change anything? Was it worth it? It worked out so well for me. My life is so good. I am reluctant to answer any questions about the past and changing it or regretting it because it's just hard to imagine it working out better. But uh, a partial answer to that question is I wish I had learned how to sell earlier. Mm. So I was forced into the job of head of sales and marketing as we were running out of cash in 19, 1982. So we were heading toward uh, Fume and uh, I got replaced as CEO and, <laughs> and given the job of head of sales and marketing with zero revenue. And uh, so I grew revenue from zero to a million a month in two years, and then we went public. So that was my contribution. But had I been better at selling before that, uh, life would have been easier. For example, IBM gave me two chances. They paid me two grand each time to come to IBM and convince them to use Ethernet. And uh, I didn't do any research. I didn't unearth their considerations. I didn't know who the decision maker was. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I just went and gave the speech twice. Once in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, and once in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And I was great. I won the argument. But as you know from selling, you can win the argument but lose the sale. And that's what I did. I didn't ask for the order, for example. I just gave my speech about how cool Ethernet was, and IBM went off and did a, a, a competing technology, which it took me a couple, a couple of decades to kill. We had to kill two monopolies. We had to kill AT&T and we had to kill IBM in order to build the internet, to kill the monopolies yeah. of those two companies. So it's about the competition. No, was there anyone close to kind of like killing you guys or you're like, oh my God, like this? Well, Cisco is the one that got away. So Cisco was founded the year we went public uh, we, had an we had an observer on our board. When we went public, he left our board and founded Cisco. And then Cisco passed us after a while, uh, maybe 10 years later. They were the one that got away. And so Cisco still exists, obviously, and they're big successful. And 3Com is now part of uh, HP. Is there other recommendations of where to learn sales? It turns out when I worked for Xerox, part of Xerox, it was a big monopoly, very profitable company. It had uh, development for its employees. So I took a course called Xerox Selling Skills. At this course, uh, there's, you can buy it today. It exists today. All but right. there's lots of books about selling. So Xerox Selling Skills was the... And then I took the course that uh, Xerox had a university in uh, its own university, uh, sales for tr not sales training, for training in general. So I took managing tasks through people and I took Xerox selling skills at Xerox. Not at MIT, not at Harvard, not at Stanford, yeah. at, at Xerox. For someone starting out in their career um, or things you wish you'd known, sounds like one of them is selling. Selling is... What are, are there other things you would take for your kids or... You know, let's go back to selling. There's many kinds of selling. So there's being VP of sales and marketing and, and knowing, the knowing the difference between sales and marketing, for example, is pivotal. And then there's being a sales manager, but then there's being a salesperson. But then there's selling yourself in a job interview. or So selling is a very big word. And uh, I, my regret is I didn't know that earlier. It would have uh, been uh, a simpler life. Is that better or worse? Well, I'm sure it could have been better. Go on with that? I think if I had been able to convince IBM to use Ethernet, my life would have been easier because I spent the next... Imagine going to work every day with your wife and your board of directors and your customers all telling you that your invention and your principal product is going to be killed shortly by IBM every day. And then 10 years goes by and the numbers, oh, look at that. We sold 
a million of them. We made a card in, in 19, uh, September of 82, we shipped a card. The first, you plug it into your IBM PC and it puts yeah. the IBM PC on the internet, on the ethernet and thereby on the internet. And we, um, we started selling those cards for about $1,000 each. And uh, I remember we started selling hundreds per month Whoa, well, take a hundred multiplied by a thousand. Yeah. That's pretty good. A, a couple of years later, we were selling a million a month. And uh, that's when the company became a multi billion dollar company. After the company went public, how did money improve your life? Well, before we went public, I had a round of finance. It's complicated how it happened, but in short, I went to every employee, it was roughly 35 employees with a yellow graph pad and I wrote their name and I asked them how many shares of the company would they like to buy if they could. Of course, it's very, it's very unusual for employees to buy at that early stage. But all 35 of them went back to their families and they came back with a number, the number of shares they wanted to buy from me personally. And so I, uh, I was able to sell $250,000 worth of stock to so every employee had all the stock that they could afford. And by the way, the big buyer was our receptionist. She syndicated. So, so I had $250,000 and I went and deposited the Bank of America. And then I went to the ATM in uh, Stanford Shopping Center, yeah. where I live quite near there. And uh, went to the ATM and withdrew $500 just to see if it would work. You know, like, is the money actually there? Yeah, so that's sort of a comment on how unaccustomed I was to having money. Is that I wanted to prove that I actually had it, and there it was. Uh, so we bought a big house and had got married. Had to, I was married already, but we had children, uh, and I uh, bought a Corvette, a summer house in Maine. We go to Maine every summer now. I have a boat, I've had it for 20 some years. Her name is Enthusiasm, I bought her. She's a great boat. Um, but I have, I, uh, so we've taken care of our kid, going back to the you know, money. The, the kids are now taken care of. We've set up trust funds for them, modest. And now our goal is to spend all of our money before we die. And the big problem is we don't know exactly when we're going to die. So that's the problem. Well, we could arrange it. We could set a date certain and then just spend our money until we ran out on that date certain. Uh, we could do that. Uh, <laughs> um, and we're, uh, we make big donations to various things. My, my specialty is professorships at MIT. I'm in the process of, I have just finished endowing the third, uh, so there's three professors at MIT who are endowed by me. And I like to do it now but while I'm still alive. A lot, too many people donate money after they die. That's yeah. no fun at all. Yeah. But I, I got three professors at MIT and I call them up, they answer. <laughs> and I ask them what they're doing, they tell me and it's great to find out. And it's, it's, I'm a trustee of MIT, so I continue to be involved there. And having my three professors, by the way, they're not my professors, but they do occupy an endowment over which I have no say whatsoever. <laughs> do, you, do you remember your first salary after you graduated? I do remember my sophomore year, I had started work and I was uh, a programmer. And uh, I hadn't gotten into hard work quite yet, so I was still in software. And uh, my dad, who was, a gyro, who was a gyroscope technician in the aerospace industry on Long Island, saw my pay stub. And I was making more money than him. And his reaction was funny. He was happy he had succeeded. <laughs> in other words, one of his goals was to launch his family. And his son was now making more money than he was. And that was my sophomore year, 1966. What's the silliest thing you've spent on? The silliest thing? Pers yeah, you mean personally? Yeah. Well, I almost killed myself with a fast boat. I bought a 50-knot boat. <laughs> and in Maine, there are very few sandbars. It's all granite. 
comes to the surface. And I always hit one at 50 knots. And if you hit a granite ledge at 50 knots, your boat virtually explodes. And I managed to at the last minute. So we sold that boat immediately after I almost killed everybody. Uh, I had to get better at navigation. I got better at navigation. What got invented was the GPS. This was pre-GPS. So I was uh, using, you know, this kind of navigation, and I didn't Dead see reckoning. the yeah, and I didn't see the rock there, so I'm Oof. whizzing 50 knots, bam, 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 and then the water looked funny. It just looked funny, so I powered down, swerved to the right, and I could see the as the boat turned, I could see the rocks and the water. Ugh. That was a silly purchase. Going to your question, that was yeah. a silly purchase. So I was, my current boat cruises at 12 knots, which is plenty. What's been the best things you've spent money on? Well, our kids went to good schools. That was the best investment. Uh, we, were, uh, we were living in Silicon Valley, and our kids were attending very good Tony Silicon Valley schools. And one day, we realized, as I'm dropping the kids off, that all the other people dropping the kids off at this school were blonde, uh, uh, child care professionals in German vehicles. And I'm on line with my old Mercedes and the kids. And we decided that we didn't want to raise our kids in that environment with all the nannies involved and catered birthday parties and all that stuff. So we moved to rural Maine. That may have been a silly thing to do. Because, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the schools in rural Maine are terrible. So that backfired. So then we started going to private schools in Maine. And then finally we moved to Boston and, and uh, sent our kids to prep schools in the Boston area. That was money very well spent. I was thinking about how you showed your dad your pay stub for when your kids showed you one day their pay stub. Well, my um, daughter went to the University of Southern California after um, prep school. And then uh, she went to work for Facebook. And she worked there for eight years. There's a funny coincidence in our family, and that's the, one of the four. She worked at Facebook for eight years, then she left, and now she has, uh, she started her own little company. Our son went to Boston University, and then went to Apple, and he worked at Apple for eight years, and then he left after eight years, and now he's in business with our daughter. My wife, it turns out, when she graduated from Michigan, she went to work for Sunset Magazine in Menlo Park, California, where she worked for eight years. I, after graduating from the Harvard University and MIT, went to work at Xerox for eight years. So there's a pattern there uh, in our family. Like that yeah, it's like it's like a, it's like post it's a postdoc or a graduate school. Yeah, eight years, and then you're ready to go off and do business. What kind of business are your kids starting? So they're working together on a, on a new company. Yeah, they do. It's it's called the working team. It's the two of them. And they do MVPs. So people want to start companies, they go in, and Julia is the chief product officer, and he's the coder. And they go into a small company, and they develop the MVP with, uh, it, by the way, it's different in every case, but it's, uh, it, in short, they team up with the company to do the MVP. They get offered equity, and they agonize about whether to take equity, whether to take cash. And the first few deals, they took equity, and now they want to. Now they're realizing that they, they would like some cash too. So they're looking for mixed packages, and uh, and it's kind of fun. Every once in a while, one of them will call me up for advice. How did you check your ego? Explore your career and life afterwards, after three com. How, you do How did you check your ego? Because like. I know for me with AppSumo, and I've had it in the past where like, am I the CEO? I'm the founder, and what, where, who am I now? And, and then also how to explore what, what, you know, where to take your career afterwards. So I left 3Com uh, when Eric uh, took over as CEO. It's, it's good practice for people who might conflict with his authority to leave the company. So I left to get out of the way. I was still the founder of the company, and Eric did fabulous work. So, the, so then I became a journalist. And I wrote a weekly column for a million people. And uh, that was really fun. And then after that, I became a venture capitalist for 10 years. And that was really fun. And then I became a professor for 10 years, 11 years. And that was fun. And now I'm looking for my next 10-year gig. How do you figure out these careers? How do you figure out what to do? Oh, it's like a, 
it was like an attempted docking, you know, you just keep, try to dock with various opportunities and then one of them clicks and locks in. So the, uh, there's no, one thing I'm pretty sure of is I've gone to Meta. I mean, I was an engineer, an engineering manager, division manager, CEO, journalist, venture capitalist. I am, I am so Meta now. So I want to go. I'm pretty sure I want my next gig to be less meta. So to be, I don't want to be a professor again, but I would, I do, I'm interested in doing research. So maybe doing, being a non-professorial -professor, researcher might be. You can give a, a fourth chair for yourself. Yeah. And you can do that, actually. <laughs> I'm sure they have ways of taking money. There's, yes, the, they're very resourceful in taking your money, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. What are your most proud of moments of your career? Uh, going from zero to a million dollars a month as head of sales. During that time, I had to figure out how to sell. I had to recruit a sales team, and uh, we we, uh, we did it. And if you want a full summary of the best takeaways from this conversation I have with Bob Metcalf, then click the link down below to get access to it now. If you like this video, you are going to love this video right up here where I talk to five millionaires over the age of 80 and ask them if the money was worth all the sacrifices they made. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you are not already. We have some exciting billionaire interviews coming soon. Uncle Noah loves you, and I'll see you out there. Pew, pew.